Let's turn to the Word of God, friends. We're going to be looking at Esther, chapter 3. Esther 3. So if you're new to the Christian faith, or, um, you know, you, you're kind of wondering what's this all about, don't worry. Don't worry. All you need to know this morning is that God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die in your place, to bear your sins along with the sins of the entire world. And as you repent and you put your faith in him, you will receive forgiveness and eternal life. So these things may go over the, over the top this morning. I don't know. I believe everybody will get something out of it. So Esther chapter 3, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lovely congregation this morning. We're all at a different place, but I just pray, Lord, only you can do this, and I believe you will. By your Holy Spirit, you will speak to every individual where they are at. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, verse 1. After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman. We looked at this last week. We're not going to do a recap. The son of Hamadatha the Agagite, remember? We looked at Amalek, we looked at um, Obadiah, we looked at how in times past, so many times, the, the, the tribal brothers of Israel have laughed at the demise and the um, trouble that Israel goes through. And of course, Haman was, was an Amalek, he was an Amalekite. And what it says here is, and we don't know why, we don't know why, but the king promotes him. The king promotes him. And this is really important. Note, there's two people you're going to see here at the very beginning. There is one that promotes him, and there is one that refuses to bow to him. There's two different people. So he advanced him, and he set, he, the king, set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded, so it was the king's command, that people pay homage to this Agagite. He was a very violent man, he comes from a violent background. Concerning him, but... Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. So there's two people. There is the king and there is Mordecai who sees through this man. Now whether he sees through him because he knows his descent, he knows where he comes from, there's not really any way of knowing. What I would say is this. Discernment is key in these days. Discernment is key. And quite clearly, this king could not discern the kind of man Haman was. And quite clearly, Mordecai could. Mordecai could. And as we move into this time frame that we're going into, discernment is key. Have a little look at 1 Kings for a minute. 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2. Probably verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask, what shall I give you? What do you want from me, Solomon? And Solomon said, you have shown great mercy to your servant." David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is to this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child and I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, 
a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding or discerning heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil. Of course, we know what happened. God was so thrilled that Solomon chose discernment, wisdom, discernment, that he gave him much more besides. I can remember a, a, a couple of years after September the 11th, I was taking our young son, Josiah, to primary school, um, play school. And at the time, uh, one of the prominent politicians was there, um, Anne Winterton, I think it's Anne Winterton, and um, at the time, I carried a Quran with me, with all of the verses in the Quran which were on the line about violence, promoting violence, because there were so many people at that time that didn't know what was going on. And I asked Anne, I, I, I'm not a political person at all, don't care about politics, but I asked if I could have a word with her after the, after the meeting. And she said, certainly. So I took her, we, I took her to, to, to my car outside of the school and I opened the Quran and I went through the verses and I said, Anne, Islam is not a peaceful religion. And she looked at me and she said, you know that and I know that. But what can we do? Now, what we're going to look at this morning is what we can do. There are things that we can do. We are up against the Goliath. And there are things that we can do. Benjamin Netanyahu said uh, a couple of days ago, this is an indictment of higher education uh, of many places in the West. People who are supposedly educated cannot distinguish right from wrong and good from evil. That's what he said, and it's absolutely true. Listen, listen to this. This man was going to be the king of Israel, and what he asked for is the ability to be able to discern between good and evil. And that's what we need to pray for our politicians, for those that are leading this country. Pray that they are given the discernment to know the difference between what is good and what is evil. And friends, we can do something, as we'll see in Esther. We, 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 we don't believe in total fatalism. We believe that, we, that as we stand in the gap, God can move. And so please make that part of your prayer. And there are those, I'm sure you know, I don't want to mention names, there are those that don't know their right hand from their left hand in politics today. Haven't got a clue. Willfully haven't got a clue. Willfully. But God can open their eyes. Amen? Amen. If he could do it for Saul of Tarsus, he can do it. If he can do it for the son of Hamas, he can do it. Amen? Amen. <coughs> And so discernment is key. That's the first thing, discernment. The king promotes him, Mordecai will not bow to him. Now here's the key. Let me show you the key, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5. And this is why, if, you, if you're concentrating in this morning, this is why so many milky, frothy, milkshaky churches don't know what's going on today. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Have you noticed that babies will put anything in their mouths? I'm sure Richard and Leanne 
uh, understand that. They get to an age where they'll put anything in their mouths. They reach out for anything and they're constantly trying to eat anything because they're babes. But it says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that, that is, those who by reason of use have had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Can you see this, friends? This is so important. Milky, frothy ser uh, sermonettes for Christianettes. These kind of come in, let me make you feel good about yourself, and, and off you go. I'll stick in the New Testament. I've heard so many Christians say, you don't even need to look in the Old Testament. Christianity is about the New Testament. That is absolute nonsense. You're never going to understand what's going on today unless you understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament is meat and the Old Testament helps us to discern between what is good and what is evil. What is going on today can be understood completely if we understand the Old Testament. And so is it important today that we understand God's word like never before? Discernment, discernment, discernment. The king promotes him. Mordecai won't bow to him. And I'm telling you, friends, we haven't got much time left to have a voice. But while we have time, we have to use our voice. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. I know what you say. Well, this is what I would be saying. Well, what about new Christians? What about people that don't know the Bible that well? Well, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, that there are different gifts given out to the body. And one of those gifts, you've got the gift of miracles, you've got another prophecy, and you have the discerning of spirits. In other words, when you get born again, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Hunger and thirst to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit because God wants to, 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 to give his body gifts. And one of them is to discern between something that is good and something that is evil. Amen. Amen. So even a babe with the discerning of spirits... They might not understand the Bible necessarily, but at least they can say there's something about this that just does not feel right to me. Acts chapter 13, verse 9. Paul's on his first missionary journey. He wants to make a big impression. He wants to pack the church is full of people he wants to be a, an elite preacher in stadiums and be able to write books and have a wonderful ministry and have a film cameras follow him around everywhere so he plays everything politically perfectly so that you know he, uh, he doesn't get tripped up no 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 that that's not Paul at all the first time we see a major problem on his first missionary journey, he discerns there's something wrong and he goes for it. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. So what's going on here very quickly? There's a man who's possessed by an evil spirit that's stopping the, the folk on the island from receiving the gospel. And it happens all the time. It happens regularly. Stopping the people from receiving the gospel. But this man particularly has a major problem. So it says, he's, he, he, we've stood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Be, be careful of, of preachers that won't look you in the eye. Be careful of preachers that won't look you in the eye. Be careful. There's a reason why people don't look you in the eye, folks. It isn't just a thing. There's a reason. Paul looked intently at him, 
and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind. And on it goes. Can you see, folks, this is the beginning of the church. It's a bit like Ananias and Sapphira. At the beginning of the church, when the church was red hot, white hot actually, it was such a movement. These things didn't stand a chance of getting a foothold. Not a chance. Because the church was discerning. They were discerning of wrong spirits. They were discerning of lies. That's what it was like. And the church today desperately needs discernment. So many people today spouting things from the pulpit concerning what's going on that are completely unscriptural, completely unbiblical. Why are they doing that? Because many, many years ago, they threw out the Old Testament. So they haven't got a clue. And according to Hebrews chapter 5, if you're not on solid food, you won't discern between good and evil. Discernment. Amen? Amen. Discernment. Let's go back to Esther. Then the king's servants, who were within the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman, to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So basically, they asked him, well, why? How, come, how come you're not bowing? And Mordecai says, Because I'm a Jew. And the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me and you shall not bow. And he knew there was something about this man that was spiritual and he would not bow to that spirit. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. He was extremely angry. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. You can see a back picture here. You can see this history. But they had told him of the people of Mordecai, in other words, the Jewish people. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole of the kingdom of Xerxes. The so it's called here, the people of Mordecai, the Jewish people. Now, hopefully you understand, there has never been a nation that has so many times been, uh, the enemy has attempted to completely wipe the, uh, the, the Jewish nation out. So many times it's ridiculous. I've told you this many times. My uncle Les is an agnostic. He, he worked on microprocessors way back in the 70s. But he says to me, the greatest evidence that there is a God is the existence of the Jewish people. He says, that's the thing that most... Prove to me that there is a God, that those people still exist. They shouldn't exist, but they do. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, and the twelfth year of King Xerxes, they cast lots, poor, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. And Haman said to King Xerxes, so he'd already cast lots, and it was kind of, basically about 11 months from that time. So 11 months from that time, they, they planned that in every single area, every part of this massive empire, the Jewish people would be annihilated on that day. So it took an awful lot of preparation. As we know now, what happened on October the 7th took an awful lot of preparation. There is a certain people scattered, the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from the other laws. Now notice he doesn't let him know who these people are, because these people had favour with Cyrus, you see. So he's very careful, and this of course is what politicians do. They're very economical with the truth at times. 
That's, that's what they do. And he says they do not keep the king's laws. Well, that's not actually true. They did keep the king's laws, as did Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Most of the laws they kept. Most of them they did. And this would be the same here. Most of the laws they would keep. There were laws that when they went against the Bible, they didn't keep them. But look at how this is put over. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. I mean... If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasury. Now, 10,000 talents of silver is two thirds of the annual budget of the entire kingdom of Persia. It's an astronomical amount of money that Haman promises to pay if he can annihilate the Jewish people. Astronomical amount of money. And there's certainly a suggestion that this money, later on, that this money comes from the plunder of the Jewish people. That a lot of this money will come from them anyway. It's their plunder. We saw it in the Second World War. How did that war machine keep on rolling and rolling and rolling? Because as soon as they invaded a country, they went straight to the bank. And they opened the vaults and they took the gold. And they bought all the armory, everything they needed for the next invasion with the gold they had from the banks. It's plunder. That's how it works. And of course, there was an awful lot of Jewish gold. An awful lot of Jewish gold. So the king took his signet ring, and it's incredible, or is it? <laughs> or is it incredible how easily this king is manipulated? When you look at politicians today, it is incredible how easily they are manipulated. The king took his signet ring, from his hand, and he gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagai, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The people are given to you, do to them as seems good to you. 127 provinces, a massive empire. And he's giving this Haman, who's really the prime minister, he's saying, Whatever you want to do to these people, whatever you want to do to them, do it. I'm giving you the go-ahead. That is anti-Semitism. There is no rhyme or reason to it. It makes no logical sense. I hate these people because the reason changes, it's, but it's anti-Semitism. It's a spirit, and there's a reason for it. The king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month and the decree was written according to all that Haman commanded to the king's satraps. To, now look at these, there's three. If you look in Ephesians 6, there's, you can see there's different classes of, in the demonic realm, different levels. And here you have different levels in the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old uh, sorry, I've skipped a bit. So let's go back to the king's satraps to the, and to the governors who were over each of the provinces and also to the officials. There's three levels. Three levels. And what you see here is this meticulous plan to annihilate these people. And so it says, it says that the letters went out, these sealed with the king's ring, they went out, sent by the couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. People have no idea. When you chant Palestine to be free from the river to the sea, it's a chant for the annihilation of the Jewish people. That there's no place for them. D does everybody understand that? That is what the chant is. There is no place for them whatsoever in Israel. 
Nowhere. The, 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 the buzzword today is occupation. That's the buzzword today. Oh, occupation, occupation, occupation. Hamas has, has one goal. Their goal is to occupy the entire world. That's their goal. To occupy the entire world. To bring the entire world under Sharia law. Am I going on about occupation, occupation, occupation? They don't know what occupation is. They haven't got a clue. There is no discernment. And if you don't see it before you see it, you will never see it. Very quickly, just turn to Revelation chapter 13. You want to see what occupation is going to look like? What it's actually going to look like, it's here. A couple of years after September the 11th, when we started to get terror attacks all over the place, do you remember? I had a dream, a very clear dream. And in that dream, I was standing in my dad's conservatory. My dad's conservatory is his pride and joy, so he spends all his time. If I converse with my dad, it's in his conservatory. And we're standing in his conservatory, looking out over England's green and pleasant lands. You know, we can, it's, it's a silly thing, but in the dream, we could see all of England from his conservatory. And as I'm looking with my dad at these rolling, beautiful hills, there's an invasion that's taking place from the sky. And things are coming down, which are alien to us, to my dad, to me, to the West. Alien to us. We don't understand it. But they're coming down and they're landing and they're beginning to spread in every direction. And in the dream, I said to my dad, Dad, can you see this? And he looked me clearly in the eyes, right in my eyes, and he went, no. And I woke up. And when I woke up, three words came, invasion, occupation, destruction. Followed immediately by three other words, death, burial and resurrection and at that moment I knew that the first three words were, were, were Satan's three phases for this world he's going to invade this world with evil he's going to occupy this world in evil and eventually his hopes are to destroy it completely invasion occupation and destruction but God has a plan for the church God's plan for the church is this death burial and resurrection that is God's plan for you and for me that the church will go down not up first we're going to go down the church will have to die before it's resurrected the church goes through three phases death burial and in that burial we will become a sweet aroma in heaven and then will come a mighty resurrection. At the same time as that resurrection, it won't be the world or the... Uh, uh, it will be the enemy itself that's destroyed. Do you understand? It backfires completely. So Satan that's planning the destruction of so many things, in the end, it is himself. It is his people. But there's three phases for this world. Invasion... Occupation, destruction. These people have no idea what occupation is. They haven't got a clue. They're spraying all this, this graffiti, going over the bridges. They have no idea what occupation looks like. But occupation is described in Revelation chapter 13 to the T. We haven't, we, we, I was going to look at it, but I think you understand what Revelation 13 is. There's nowhere to hide. Everywhere is occupied. They have no idea what occupation means. But there's a time coming when this world will be occupied in every state by the Antichrist. And every official will be in his hand. And the command will go forth for the annihilation of the Jewish people and everybody that names the name of Christ. That's occupation. But the church 
is going to go through three stages. Death, burial, and resurrection. And by the way, if you don't know this, I'm sure you do, it's already happening. We're already in the process of dying. It's our only hope. Our only hope is to die. And I say that as somebody that doesn't really understand what he's saying. <laughs> I don't fully understand this at all. But I know it's right. I don't understand it up here, but I understand it in my spirit. Let's go back to Esther. So, this is the king. He's so easily manipulated. So many politicians are so easily manipulated. My lovely daughter, she, she, she wanted to, to study Israel. And she went to university to study Israel and um, the Middle East. You can imagine what they taught her, right? It's just, the world is sick, folks. And they're taking people who, some people that have had a lovely view of, of Israel and God's people and twisting them so terribly. And we're not saying this morning that Israel can do no wrong, that the, that the Jews are morally better than anybody else. They're not at all. These people in Esther are secular, most of them are secular. They never even went back to Jerusalem and they got the chance. But God even loves the secular Jews as he does us. He loves us. And his patience is supposed to lead to our repentance. So the, the, the order went out to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women in one day, in one day, in one day. This could have been written a few weeks ago. And the copy of the document was to be issued as a law in every province, being published for all people that should be ready for that day. And the couriers went out and hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink. Um, unbelievable. They sat down, and they had a good drink together, and the city of Sushan was perplexed. I wish you could say that today. I wish you could say today that Great Britain was perplexed. But I'm not sure whether that's the case anymore. I wish you could say that Europe was perplexed or America was perplexed, but I'm not sure whether you could say that anymore. There was a time when you went to Auschwitz, when you went to Birkenau, so that you had seen the size, the scale of the operation, so that you could pass it on and say never again. But when people can see those photographs and say they had it coming to them, it's very strange. Then Mordecai... And all, this, uh, chapter 4, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. And he went as far as the front of the king's gate for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. He doesn't want party poopers around him, does he? Who wants miserable people around you. You want people around you to say everything's fantastic. This is a great thing you're doing, O King. Brilliant. What a, what a great idea. In every province where the King's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And I say, we're a million miles away for, as, a, as a church from being where we should be. We all know that. But the, to me, there was a, a smoking flax last Sunday night. That's what I see as a smoking flax. I've seen adverts on Facebook at churches. It's that time of year again. 
and they've got the Christmas trees with the baubles and stuff. It's that time of year again. Let's all get ready for Christmas. Unbelievable. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept it. People just don't get it. Jesus talked about weeping. He talked about mourning. And he actually talked about those that laugh now will weep in the future. That somehow as Christians, we've always got to come in with this kind of plastic. Remember those plastic masks they used to rob banks with? With the great big smiles on? <coughs> the, the world is in a mess, folks. And we have something to mourn. Of course we serve an awesome, great God. But who wouldn't mourn? Let's go to verse 13. Cut to the quick here. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther. You need to speak to Esther. She's not getting it. Remember we looked at this last week. Six months of myrrh. Six months of beautification. She's got a beautification. Anything Esther wants, she, she gets now. That can happen in life. You can go through times you like where everything is going your way. Everything is going your way. You finally reach that point in life. You've, you've worked for this all your life. To get to that point where you can relax in your palace and so on. And Mordecai has to send a message to Esther to tell Esther, Don't think you're safe, Esther. You're a Jew. How can you be safe? For if you remain completely silent at this time. Let's just stop there. If you remain completely silent at this time. If you want to turn with me, turn with me to Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. What is Paul saying here? He's not ashamed of the gospel. What is he saying? Oh, all you've got to do is you can show you're a Christian by your actions. You don't need to say anything. Stay silent. Just show you're a Christian by your actions. Friends, I've said this so many times before. There are Buddhists. There are Sikhs. There are Hindus. There are atheists. There are agnostics. There are good living Muslims. There's lots of people on this earth that want to do good. This is not the time to close your mouth. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. And the problem that we have, the reason why we are where we are in this country today, in 2023, is because decades ago, the church became ashamed of the fact that Christ is the only exclusive way of salvation. And when that happened, subconsciously, we allow to come in, to seep into this country, many, many, many different ways. This is not the time to be quiet. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. For if you confess with your mouth, it doesn't say if you meditate, it doesn't say if you help that old deer across the road, it doesn't say if you do some nice things for your neighbour or this one or that one. It says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you will be saved. There is a confession of the mouth. That's why it says in 1 John, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit because there comes a time when unless you have the Holy Spirit, you won't want to say Jesus is Lord. I went to, a, I did a funeral 
on Monday of a person that has all his life he was an unbeliever, but right at the end of his life, twice he cried out, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Acts chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. Acts 18, verse 9 and 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in, a, in a, the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent. What did he say to Esther? If you remain silent. Do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. I went on my walk as usual. I, I think it was Wednesday day, into the fields, very muddy, sloppy fields. And there's nobody that walks in those fields, particularly on a day like that. And anyway, I see this guy coming towards me with his dog. So we stop in the middle of the field. Turns out it's the guy that runs the gym on Glebe Farm. In the three years we've been there, I've probably spoke to him for less than a minute in one go. We just say hello. He's a nice guy. We just say hello, that's it. But on that day, Wednesday, he stopped me in the middle of the field. He says, you're a religious guy, aren't you? He says, I, I knew instantly what he wanted to talk about. He says, what's going, what's all this that's going on at the moment in the Middle East, you know? Da, 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 da. And I tried to tell him, but he didn't want to stop talking. So he, uh, he, he continued to tell me that he'd been out and bought a Quran. And that, he, he says, I've always had my suspicions about democracy in the West. He says, it's never made sense to me. But he says, reading the Quran, he says, I realise that their governmental system actually works. I mean, folks, this is, he's been on the farm for three years, right? This is the most normal Western guy you will ever meet in your life. And he stops me to say this. And um, I said, well, first of all, I can tell you where the Bible and the Quran agree. They agree that the bloodiest times in the whole of history are about to happen. The, the Quran says that at the end of this, this guy called the Mahdi will come and he will destroy the Jewish people and the Christians. And he looked at me and went, yep. I'm thinking, what? That, there's a slight, just such a normal look on his face. Yep. So I said, well, I said, that, so Jesus, I said, Jesus is the good shepherd. He lays down his life for the sheep. He, he came to die for us because we could not pay the price for ourselves. And I told him that uh, nowhere in the Bible, uh, sorry, nowhere in the Quran do you see the word love. And he said, yep. I'm thinking, what is going on here? What's happening? What's happening to society? There's something happening, folks. Something's not right. So I spent an hour talking with him. And I said to him, what happened on, on October the 7th? As much as, when you think of the SS, as much as how despicable they were, you would not have done that to their families. What they did to the Jewish people, you wouldn't do it to their families. He said, yeah. But his final remarks were, but they've got it coming to them. And it just doesn't make sense folks and I don't know whether the church are getting it this is in the middle of a boggy field this is somebody that all his life is just a very normal person do not keep silent because if we do keep silent we're going to have problems and we'll get to that as we come to it. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. I have some Muslim friends. As, as you know, I've had some miraculous encounters with Muslims. Miraculous. Totally miraculous. Some of the loveliest people. 
They, they, and they love to chat, you know. They're very spiritual people. They love to chat. But we're talking here about salvation. We're talking here about the only way to heaven. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8. Open your mouth for the speechless. Open your mouth for the speechless. When people begin and they talk first and foremost about Palestine from the river to the sea and there's no mention of what happened on October the 7th, there's something wrong. Open your mouth for those that have no mouth anymore. For those that are speechless now. For those that are gone, deceased, been burnt alive, burnt to a crisp. Spinal cords that have been fused together in the heat. Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth and judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. This is not the time to keep silent, folks. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 18. And so they called them and commanded them not to speak. Not to speak. And I, I am, I'm not decrying the go, uh, good works, folks. I'm not. But this is a time to open your mouth. Not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right, in the sight of God, to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, this is important because I believe that the reason why some people don't speak is because they've never gotten saved. It's just religion. They go to church week in, week out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. But they, they're not actually saved. So what have they got to speak about? We cannot speak about the things that we've seen in there. Well, we don't, we, we've never actually, we don't even know what it is. We just go along and join in. There, there are so many people that aren't speaking because they've got nothing to say. They cannot look another person in the eye and actually tell them that they have an, a relationship with Jesus Christ. So they have nothing to say. They have nothing to say. There are others that are backslidden. They had something at one time. They were going on with God at one time. Some people think they've done their shift. It's, they're in retirement before they're dead. I've done my bit now. It's somebody else's turn. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 2 4 but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel even so we speak even so we speak of course the world doesn't want to hear it we're at that time We've got people that have literally just become Christians right now. Just become Christians. And the world does not want to hear this message right now. But I'll tell you this, to encourage you. When you find a real saint, you will soar. When you bump into somebody that has the same heart for you, you will soar. When God introduces you to the living stones and you begin to slot into one another, you will soar in God because God has got his people Everywhere. 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, 17. If you keep silent, that's what Mordecai says to Esther. If you keep silent. 1 Kings 18, 17. Then it happened when Ahab, Ahab, bad king, boo, boo, Ahab, naughty king. <coughs> Now, when Ahab saw Elijah, Elijah's the good one, give him a clap. Hey, that Ahab said, is that you, troubler of Israel? And Ahab spoke up. And what he says was simple, sublime, straight to the point. No need to mess about with Elijah. There's no messing about with Elijah anyway. 
I have not troubled Israel. It's not me that's troubled Israel. It's you. And this is what he says. He says two things. Because you have forsaken the word and you have followed false gods. That's all he says. That's all he needs to say. I'm not the trouble of Israel. You are. Number one, you've forsaken the word. And because you have forsaken the word, the fruit of forsaking the word is you now embrace false gods. That's it. Speak up. Speak up. Judges chapter 16, verse 19. I often talk to my good friend, First Timothy, in the week, and we go through all the things that are happening uh, around the planet, and um, we have a good chinwag, and, um, and he said he was listening to somebody the other day that was talking about Christians that just don't understand what's going on. And this person said, get your head out of Delilah's lap. Get your head out of Delilah's lap. Do you understand that? Do you get that? She wants to kill you. She doesn't want to protect you. She wants to kill you. Get your head out of Delilah's lap. You're, you, you're not going to be safe in your palace. Get your head out of Delilah's lap. She's out to kill you. She wants to blind you and imprison you. She wants to make you into a slave. Get your head out of Delilah's lap. Judges chapter 16. Verse 19. Then she lured him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head and she began to torment him. <laughs> this is Delilah. Oh, she's so lovely. She loves me for the first time in my life. I've been first time in my life. I understand how this world works <laughs> in Delilah's lap. <laughs> and she starts to torment him and his strength had left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before. I'll just go out with the strength that I've always had at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the spirit had departed from him. Get your head out of Delilah's lap. She has no love for you at all. Mark chapter 13, verse 11. When they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. What you will speak. But whatever is given to you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Do you, does everybody get this morning? How important it is when Mordecai says to Esther, if you keep silent, Esther, if you keep silent, this beloved church is not the time for you to keep silent. Let's come to a conclusion this morning. I have many things to say, but I uh, can't say everything. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Now, let me just say this very, very quickly. Very quickly. There are times when we are called to stand, and there are times in history, where there was no possible way that we could. Let me read Isaiah 59, 16. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained it. Let me tell you, there was a time in history when there was nobody 
that could stand in the gap. There was nobody that could pay the price. There was no one to come to the aid of Israel or the world. And when it comes to salvation, there is no one. The only one that's qualified to save is Jesus. And we must never forget that because he's already come. And it tells us in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And thank God that's already happened. Somebody has already gone to the cross for you. Somebody that was completely innocent. Somebody that has always been. And the Bible says he, Jesus, that knew no sin, became sin. I've only got to think about my own sins. Nobody else's. No one else's. Just my own sins upon him, upon the cross, is enough, was enough horror and embarrassment and shame, mine alone. But he bore the sins of the entire world. For every tribe, every tongue, every nation. He did it for you. There was somebody, there was somebody when you were not willing, when you couldn't, when it was impossible, there was somebody that did. Now, that to you may seem like a small thing. Well, go and look at every other world religion. Because in every other world religion, it's how we get to heaven. There is only one religion of all the religions that teaches us that God is actually reaching us. He came to pay the price. There was one. There was one. And his name is Jesus. And so I do kind of apologize this morning if some of this has gone over your head. But please, 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 there is nothing more important than the gospel. If you're going to be silent on political issues, that's your prerogative, but never be silent on the gospel. Never. Because it's the only hope, it's the only deliverance. There is no other deliverance. I could say a lot more, but time's coming to a conclusion this morning. But if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. That's incredible. If you don't do your bit, God will find somebody else who will. But if you think by not doing your bit, you'll be safe. This is what Mordecai is saying. He said, I promise you, you perish. That's shocking, isn't it? That is shocking. Yet who knows, yet who knows whether you've actually come to the palace, whether you've come to the kingdom, whether you've come into all this fortune, whether you've been brought into this position in parliament, in, in, in schools, in factories, in hospitals, wherever it is, whether you're a mom, it doesn't matter, or a dad or a granddad. Who knows whether you've been brought into your position for this very time in history? Who knows whether you are exactly right now where God intends you to be for this very hour? That everything has come to this point for you. Who knows? Who knows? And Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, I love this. Because if this was today, and this was done by email, they'd be slating one another off back and forward. Email, going back and forward. What, what did you mean by that? I don't like the tone of your voice. You know what emails are like? Shocking. But it's just one way, then the other way. Bang, come on then. Go gather all the Jews, says Esther. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Sushan and fast for me. And neither eat nor drink for three days and three nights. This was a total fast. This wasn't uh, break your fast at the end of the day. This was a total fast. Three days and three nights. Fast for me. 
fast for me. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Very similar to Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. God is able to deliver us. Friends, our politicians need to get their head out of Delilah's lap. They have to do that. We need to pray for our leaders to have discernment at this time. We shouldn't be promoting Haman. Mary came into the presence of Jesus and she took a pension plan which was an alabaster jar. She took a pension plan, her insurance policy for a life, the equivalent of £30,000 worth, £30,000 in our money. And she came and she broke the seal of the alabaster jar and she poured it over Jesus' feet and the room was filled with sweet aroma filled with sweet aroma and she undid her hair which you never undo your hair for anybody apart from your husband no, it's not done she undid her hair. It was shocking what she did. Shocking. And she washed the feet of Jesus with her hair and her tears. And myrrh, myrrh, myrrh. And Jesus said, what she's done, she's done for my burial. And what she's done will go out. It will fill the earth. What this woman has done will fill the earth. The room was filled with sweet aroma. In Leviticus, there's a free will offering. And it goes up into the presence of God as a sweet aroma. The room was filled with sweet aroma. Satan has a plan. Invasion, occupation, and destruction. Jesus has a plan. Death, burial, and resurrection. A sweet aroma. Amen.